No one will care for you like your parents will care for you. At Annur Education Center, we give orphans a loving home, clothing, food, and education. Be the orphan's parent by sponsoring an orphan for 18,000 rand or 1,500 rand per month. Annur Education Center, a place where orphans call home. Imagine, imagine a world where each person has access to their basic rights. A world where everyone is equal. Imagine a world where each person will have an equal share in each single seed of wheat. Where each child has the freedom to learn. This Ramadan, we ask you to feed the fasting in 14 countries around the world with AMA. Provide an iftar box for 100 rand, a hamper for 1,500 rand, or feed a village for 15,000 rand. Donate today at Africa Muslims Agency and imagine the difference you can make. Kindly contact him. He's got it in all colors, black, green, and white, so you can speak to him directly. Mr. Mulaji, can I ask you to collect this, please? So now everyone can also see who they can deal with directly. I don't get any commission. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa ashabi wa barik wa sallim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri Wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Bihaqi habibina wa Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yasallun ala al-Nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa ashabi wa barik wa sallim. My dearly beloved elders, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, and I see we've got some youth here as well also, mashallah, I greet you with the beautiful Islamic greetings of love, peace and mercy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First and foremost, allow me to welcome each and everyone to our first Hajj class. I've decided to do it in three parts because we will only be concentrating on the shurut of Hajj, which means the requirements for Hajj. When does Hajj become furled on you? And once Hajj become furled upon you, you need to know and understand the arkan of Hajj and also the five days of Hajj we are going to discuss today, starting today, and then also next week, Saturday, and then the following Saturday. So we'll only do the three Saturday afternoons, and after that our first Hajjaj will be leaving for Makkah to Mukarramah and Madinah to Munawwara to perform the holiest journey in the life of every Muslim, and that is the journey of Hajj. And I can see, well, lights, I can see on the faces of everyone sitting here, the reason why you are here. Some of you might not be going for Hajj this year, but you've got that burning feeling in your heart. You've got that longing in your heart to go and Allah makes it easy, inshallah, amin, for each and every one of us who's got that niyyah, amin. So, First and foremost, the Hajj is the fifth pillar of Islam. 
it is the last pillar of Islam. The first pillar, of course, we know that Islam is like a superstructure that stands on five pillars. Like you can see the masjid rests on these four pillars. If you take these pillars away, what do you think will happen to the roof? I want interaction and I know no one is sleeping here. What do you think will happen to the roof? It will collapse. So important these pillars are. Now Islam is like the superstructure that rests on five pillars. And the first pillar of Islam is Shahada to Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. It's the first pillar of Iman to believe in Allah and to believe in all the Prophets and that Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and final Prophet of Allah. The moment you believe you have Iman, then you must make Salah. You must fast in the month of Ramadan. You must be charitable to give Zakah and to give Sadaqah and always reach out for the upliftment of people. And finally, the fifth pillar is to go on Hajj to the Bayt al Haram and to be able to stand on the plains of Arafah for those who are by the means, meaning for those who have the health, the wealth, the ability, and the affordability, it becomes then a duty upon them to perform the Hajj. That's why Allah says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim wa lillahi ala nasi hajjul bayt liman istata'a ilayhi sabila." Hajj is a duty that every human being and every believer we owe it to Allah. Those who can afford it and who can find a way to do the Hajj, it is a duty that we owe to Allah. Now, everything has a meaning and a definition. The word Hajj, the literal meaning of the word Hajj means intention or purpose. But the technical meaning, which means the meaning according to the Sharia, it means to go to Makkah and to perform certain rituals and certain manasik and certain ibadah in order to perform the hajj. So hajj has its literal meaning and it has its sharia meaning. So according to the majority of scholars, they say that hajj only became fard in the sixth year after the hijrah. Meaning for the first 13 years when the Prophet received the first revelation of Iqra, for the first 13 years he stayed in Mecca preaching Islam. But he was tortured, he was persecuted, his close followers and friends were killed in the process by the kuffar. And then 13 years after that Allah ordered him to make the hijrah from Makkah to Medina, where he is buried today in the holy city of Medina. Only by the sixth year, when he stayed in Medina, Allah made the Hajj farled upon the Prophet compulsory, and the Prophet in his entire life. Prophet passed away at the age of 63 years, but in his entire life, he only performed Hajj once. The Prophet performed Umrah four times in his life, but he only performed one Hajj. So Hajj is farud on us only once in a lifetime. But those, of course, who want to go more than once, and they want to go twice or thrice, or they want to rather send other people who can't afford it, Allah knows best, they will follow their heart, and Allah make it easy for all of us. Amen. The Prophet was asked one day by the Sahaba, Ya Rasulullah, which is the best action that a person can perform? And the Prophet said, the best thing you can do for yourself is to have absolute Iman in Allah. Absolute Iman and trust and belief in Allah and the last day that you are here for a very short time, soon you are going to stand in Allah's divine supreme court and Allah will keep you accountable for your life. That is the best thing you can do for yourself to have absolute 
full iman in Allah. The second best thing the Prophet ﷺ said is to strive in the path of Allah, jihad. Now what is jihad? Jihad does not only mean to fight. Yes, there will come a time when the Muslims will have to rise up to defend yourself, to defend your families, your properties and your deen. But the main jihad is to fight yourself. To fight against yourself, to fight your nafs, to fight your passions, to fight your desire, your low, low desire. Fight that and fight against your nafs and shaitan. That is the real jihad. How we can cleanse ourselves from pride, from jealousy, from hasad and every disease spiritually and physically. Fight against that. That is the real jihad. And thirdly, the Nabi then said, the third best thing for you is to perform a hajj mabrur, a hajj which is clean, which is pure, and done solely for the sake of Allah. And therefore we all have in our hearts this yearning and this longing, because it takes us back many, many years ago, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam to rebuild the Kaaba. And we know that the first person that built the Kaaba, according to many scholars, was Nabi Adam alayhi salam. He laid the foundations of the Kaaba. And then later, as Allah said in the Quran, when Allah told Nabi Ibrahim to leave his wife Hajar and baby Ismail in the desert, he left them near the ruins of the foundation of the Kaaba, which was still there since the time of Nabi Adam alayhi salam. Then later when Sayyidina Ismail, baby Ismail, was a young boy of about 13, 14, round about there, Allah ordered Nabi Ibrahim to build the Kaaba on the same foundations that were still there from the time of Nabi Adam alayhi salam. And this man, Nabi Ibrahim, with his son, father and son, formed a team together, built the Kaaba. And they rebuilt the Kaaba to a certain height. And this should teach us a great lesson as parents, we need to get involved in activities and projects with our children. That same Kaaba that was rebuilt by father and son is still standing there. Still standing there. And then Allah told him, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجْ O Ibrahim, you call the people for Hajj. Now imagine Nabi Ibrahim and his son being all alone in the desert. There's no one there. No town, no village, no city, no growth, no food, no water, nothing. And Allah said to him, call the people, make the azan for the hajj. And he said, oh Allah, I'm a man here all alone in the desert. Who's going to hear my voice? It's logical thinking, isn't it? Are you with me? Come on, you can look better than that. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. yes. Say, oh Allah, my call is going to be a cry in the wilderness. No one will hear my voice. Listen what Allah said to him. You make the adhan. You make the call. I am the one who will bring the people. And because of that adhan, each and every one of us, we still have that yearning. Because the great scholars of Islam say, at that time, many, many years ago, when Nabi Ibrahim salam, made the call, the adhan for the hajj, everyone heard that call. Whether we were still in alimi arwah, in the world of the souls before we came down, wherever we are, those who were as a sperm 
in the backbone of their fathers, those who were a tiny embryo in the blessed womb of your mothers. Wherever we are, we heard that adhan and we called out, Labaik Allahumma Labaik. Labaik is not a new calling, it's a calling since that time. And the scholars say that whatever amount of labaik you gave at that time, that is the amount of times that you will go and perform hajj. And that's why you can see people sometimes two times, five times, ten times go for hajj. That is the amount of times that you have responded. And others, of course, didn't respond, which means they will never go for hajj. May Allah make us of those people who have responded to that call of Nabi Ibrahim that we can now go on this beautiful journey. Amen. And therefore, this yearning for Hajj is burning in the heart of every Muslim. It's like I can see it on your faces. That excitement, that wanting to go, it is only Allah who can take you. And please, I want to concentrate and emphasize on the fact that at the current moment, we are in very difficult times. Only one million hujaj have been selected to do the hajj for this year. Either due to so-called COVID protocol or whatever. Allah is aware of what is happening, don't worry. As sad as it is, some people are crying because now, because of only one million and because of various reasons and also because our rand is such a weak currency at this moment throughout the world that Hajj or the journey of Hajj or the expenses has reached beyond the control of many of us. Some people are crying because they have to defer their hajj, they can't go this year. Some people are crying because they really can't afford it, their hearts are there already. I want you, I want all of us to remember that Allah sees our tears. Allah hears the crying in our hearts. Allah is not unaware of anything. So you want to cry? Yes, cry to Allah. Go on your musalla. And I always tell people, go on your musalla, especially at night during the hajjah time. Stand up at night, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, whatever time you can. Make your salah to the hajjah. And then you just cry to Allah. Speak your heart out to Allah because I want you to understand Nothing and no one can take you for Hajj. These stinking rich people in this world who's got all the money, they have never been for Hajj and Umrah. So it's not your money that takes you. If it is your money that takes you, all the rich people would have been made Hajj already. It's not your money that takes you. One moment you can have money, the next moment your money is gone. It's also not the aeroplane that takes you. The aeroplane can crash. And Allah mentioned in Surah, Surah Al-Mulk in the Quran, مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَّا Rahman. Allah draws your attention to the bird and by extension of our understanding, the iron bird, which is the aeroplane, flying in the sky, with all the luggage. And you know some hujaj, when they come back from Makkah, their cases feel like there's rocks from Jabal Noor in there. You can hardly lift that cases. Yet with all that luggage, with all that baggage, with all the cans of Zamzam which are heavy, with all the people in the plane, that plane goes up bi qudratillah. It stays in the air, in the sky bi qudratillah. And it reaches its destination bi qudratillah by the power of Allah. 
Ma yumsikuhunna illa rahman What do you think Allah say? Keep that bird up there? And by extension, that iron bird, the aeroplane? Ar-Rahman. Allah is Ar-Rahman. It is His grace, His mercy, His compassion that keep us safe and that plane takes you from point A to point B. So it's not the aeroplane that takes you, it is the qudra and the power of Allah. It is not the ship that takes you. And we know in the past how we used to go to the docks area to see off our hujaj going with the ship. But it's not even the ship that takes you because even the Titanic went down. You know the Titanic? You know the Titanic? When they structured, when they constructed the Titanic, mighty ship, everyone marveled at this Titanic. And some people said, wow, what a ship. Even God won't be able to sink that ship. How arrogant people can become. How wonderful some people they think they are. Even challenging Almighty God. Saying even God cannot think the ship, sing the ship. And what did God Almighty do? Step back. It was just an iceberg. Crashed with the Titanic. And gone is the Titanic forever. So even the ship don't take you. Because the ship can go down. You purely goes with the Qudra of Allah. And therefore... Go on your knees. Go in your sujood. Stand up at night. You know what power there is in tahajjud. Especially now when it's so cold. No one wants to stand up. Like some people say, you know, when the adhan goes in the morning for fajr now, then they say, no man, I think I'm wrong. It's not really the adhan. Because it's too hot, I mean it's too cold to get out. But that is the sacrifice that Allah loves. Because the hajjud is not fard. It's not compulsory. But if you can stand up, that is what Allah loves. Cry to Allah on your musalla. And wallahi, if Allah accepts your dua, and Allah calls you, believe you me, nothing, nothing can stand in your way. No power can hold you back when Allah calls you to come to his Kaaba and to come and stand on the mighty plains of Arafah. Allah will open each and every door for you which might look shut closed for us today. If Allah opened their doors, nothing can hold you back. May Allah call all of us. Amen. And so we need to understand that this preparations for hajj various things that we need we need money we need our health we need to do preparation in every way but Allah say what does Allah do like for every journey that you want to undertake make your preparation likewise make preparation for hajj I don't wake up one morning and just decide I go for hajj I make my niyyah now already. Whether I'm going this year, I'm going the following year, or I'm going in five years, your niyyah must be there. If you have that niyyah and Allah takes you away from this world before going for hajj, then Allah will judge you and reward you according to your niyyah. So you might get there on the day of judgment in front of Allah and Allah give you the present and the gift of a hajj makbul and mabarur and you say, oh Allah, is this for me? But I didn't perform hajj. And Allah say, you had the niyyah in your heart and this is the reward of the niyyah in your heart. So all of us must have that niyyah inshallah. Make that niyyah now if you don't have it yet. So your payment of debts if you owe people money, try to pay your debts before you go. If you fear that you won't have the, the chance or the opportunity to go again, you can sit down with those people and say, look, I know I owe you so and so. Please give me maaf 
allow me to go for Hajj and I give you my word of honor as a Muslim that when I come back, I will pay my debt off to you. Then it's permissible for you to go. Some people think maybe they can't go for Hajj because they maybe got a bond on their house. If you know you're going for Hajj maybe for one month or two months, and you have the necessary installments that will see to the payment of your bond while you are gone, then it is permissible for you to go. But Allah don't want you to make it hard on yourself, finding that you don't have money, come back and there you've lost your house. No, make proper arrangements by seeing to that debts or at least your installments that you need to pay monthly on your house bond, inshallah. Also, your people that you leave behind, that depend on you, as maybe a father or a mother, you leave behind children, or we leave behind parents who are old who depend on us, then it's our duty before I go to first see that the needs of my children are covered while I'm gone, and the needs of my parents are covered, and all those who depend on me, they are covered and seen to, then I can go for Hajj. And then also make sure that you have your will written out. Now already we must have a will. Not only when we want to go for Hajj and Umrah, now every Muslim must have a will. The Prophet goes so far to say something to this effect, that no Muslim must go to sleep at night unless your will is written out under your pillow. And a will is something which is very simple. You can go to the MGC office, you can go to Al Baraka Bank, or you can approach your local imam and ask him to help you draw up your will. Or even if you have a single page where you just write out and say that I hereby state that in the event of my death, that whatever I leave behind must be distributed according to Islamic law of succession. And have it signed by yourself, have it signed by two witnesses, maybe have a stamp of a commissioner of oaths or something to make it illegal because your, your, your will is a legal paper. And we have seen people who die and they don't leave a proper Islamic will behind. There's chaos after that. Chaos. Children fighting over inheritance and such parents are not resting in their qabr. And believe you me, I've seen the ugliest, the ugliest of situations where children can't be bothered even if you tell them, why do you go on like this? Do you know that you are disturbing your parents in the, in the qabr? And they don't care two hoots. They can't be bothered. So see to our affairs while we are alive, inshallah. So, yes. Very important. The money that you go with for Hajj must be from halal source. The Nabi one day, while the Prophet was performing in Hajj, he heard on Arafah a person in Ihram calling out, Labaik Allahumma Labaik, Ya I am, O oh Allah, Ya I am. And the Nabi looked at him and the Nabi said, His Hajj is not accepted because the clothes that he had, has on or the Ihram that he has on was bought from haram money. He's traveling is from haram money. The food and drink that you eat and drink and consume is from haram money. Allah is not in need of such a person and his hajj is not accepted. So make sure that that hajj or that umrah that we perform is from completely halal sources. Work for it. Sweat for it. Or if a good person come along and they say, maybe a friend or a family member and say, I would like to send you for Hajj and Umrah, 
by all means you may accept, it is Allah's way of calling you. And a very, very important point is choose your company. Choose your company when you go on this journey because the company that you are in can make you or break you. Many people have been misled by the company that they are in. Wrong company. People playing dominoes and cards in Makkah. People playing all sorts of games. People sit in idle companies talking nonsensical stuff. Instead of going down to the haram for salah, they say, Might just make salah here yeah, in the room, in the hotel, because they, the moment they finish with their salah, they say, well, continue with their games again. Yes, wallahi, I'm not sucking these things out of my thumb. I've seen these things. Be sure that you are in a company with friends who encourage you, come let's go down for the haram. Come let's go make a umrah. Come let's go for tawaf. Come let's go down for tahajjud or qiyamul layl. Because that is the purpose why you went. And every haji must realize that once you leave your home on this journey, until you return home, your time is not yours. You have no right to waste that time that you have given to Allah. All your time now, from the time you leave home on this journey of Hajj and Umrah, until you come back home, that entire time belongs to Allah. We've got no right to waste that time. It belongs to Allah. So inshallah, I will try to make copies and next week give you some of the notes that you can go through inshallah and all the points that I'm discussing you can read through as well as your requirements like a passport, your injections, the yellow fever and the meningitis injection is compulsory. Saudi won't allow you through the borders if you have that and now we know there's an additional of the covered injections may Allah save us all whatever our views are on this I don't get involved in these debates whether you must take the covered injection or not people must think and decide for themselves but it is a necessary condition for you to be able to get your visa take your medications with you if a person with diabetic or high blood or whatever you need, daily medication, take your necessary medication that you need for your daily survival, take it with you, and pre preferably have a doctor's letter with you to, to prove that it is not drugs that you are taking into the country, but it is your personal medication that you need for your health and for your betterment. Clothing, make sure that you have proper clothing. Find out what time, like now, Hajj is now in June, July, round about there. And July, June, July, is now is the hottest time period in Saudi. It is peak summer. So don't take your gowns with, and your duffer coats, and all that thick clothing, you're going to take it and you're going to fill up your bags with unnecessary space. Take cool clothing according to the summer there that you will need there and for the ladies especially, uh, for men also, I always encourage them to take clothing with which is made of non-creased material. You get that, isn't it? Non-creasing material, some nice kurtas, some nice tops, Nice abayas, cool weather. Don't take jerseys and stuff with because you're going to get there. It takes so much space in your bag and you must bring that same clothing back which you won't use at all. You could have bought a nice gift there and you would have had place and then you won't be overweight. Laundry. Yes, now and then you'll need the laundry. There's laundry services that you can check out. Make sure about currency. I always advise people not to go via the American dollar. 
don't strengthen the American economy because America supports Israel who kill our own brothers and sisters in Palestine. So don't support the dollar. You can buy with your rand straight into the real. If you get there, they accept South African money and you can change it straight into the Saudi real. Or you can liaise with the company that you travel with or through Al Baraka Bank that you have maybe your account with, buy your Saudi rials before the time, or there's even now the card system that you can use where they update your card, your banking card, and you can draw money on that side as well. Do what is good and do what is safe for yourself, inshallah. Photos, your, your, the operator that you travel with, they will tell you the amount of passport size photos that you need. Make sure that you take that necessary photos, what they require from you, and the amount of photos that they require, and that into your operator, because one of the pictures will go on your, on your IGAMA, uh, uh, your Hajj visa, and also for your IGAMA when you get there in Saudi, inshallah. Food is definitely available in Makkah and Medina. Although it is a little expensive now, those years, unfortunately, our people had a case full of toilet rolls. You remember? When our people used to pack in, Ammal pack in a toilet roll and a di and a dai. There's toilet rolls there. Don't worry. Right? Everything is there. If you live in a nice hotel, the hotel also provide you with towels, soap, everything there. So everything is there, food is there. The only sad thing about Makkah and Medina is no kusistas. <laughs> and there's no steak pies. So if you can take that with maybe, freeze it up nicely, take that with because believe you me, on a Sunday morning you're going to lust for a kusista. Baggage, please people, baggage is always a problem with our people. Make sure that you weigh your baggage. Make sure that you don't take unnecessary stuff with. Our people is always overweight. I think this year our people won't be overweight because the rand to the real is about five rand. One rand, I mean five rand, is one real. So if you buy a tea there and the tea is maybe 10 real, in our money it is 50 rand. So if you can take some tea bags with because you can make tea in your room, water cooking, boil in your room, and you can make your tea, take some tea bags with, um, you know, sugar and stuff, those little things that you can take those things with where you can save money. But food is readily available. If need be, you can take maybe little tins of tuna with, little tins of, uh, what is that, other fish, sardines and stuff, which is healthy. Sardines is healthy. And whatever you can take with, just to save money. Because you can't buy everything, although everything is available there. But it is very, very expensive. You've seen the prices of the packages. And that price is not even the full package. Your AFA must still come, come by and your spending and your five days of Hajj is really, really expensive. Make dua that when Allah take you on this journey that Allah put khair and barakah in your money. Because you never take Allah out of the equation. Allah's hand is on the hujaj. Allah's hand is on the hujaj because Allah call you as his guest. And when Allah calls you as his guest to perform hajj and umrah, you are the guest of Allah. Allah will take care of you, but you have also to take care of yourself. Because Allah help those who help themselves. So also what is very important, <clears throat> uh, other items try to carry in your overnight bag it's like a nice size musalla in case you need to make salah, a prayer mat. Sunglasses, 
which is very important because now when it's so hot and you come into Medina or you come to Makkah's Haram, the, the Mataf area when the sun hits on there, it gives off a glare and it can actually affect your eyesight if you don't protect your eyes. So take some nice sunglasses with, you know that police sunglasses or that Supergirl or Superman sunglasses. Take some nice sunglasses to protect your eyes, a pocket-sized Quran and nice kitapis that you can read from, keep in your overnight bag, soap, sunlight soap or natural soap which is not scented, which you are going to use and need when you are in ihram, which I will explain later, which you cannot use scented soap when you're in ihram. So if you need to wash your hands or yourself, you can use sunlight soap or natural soap, which is not scented. Take your comb with, it is a comb to comb your kefi or your afro comb. You remember that afro combs? That afros. We used to have afros. That was a kam yani akhtasakadra. Every time you walk, take out the comb. Khoizerai kefi so. Right? So take your comb, your brush to comb or brush your hair because a Muslim must always look neat and tidy. Don't forget your shoe bag. Shoe bag is very important because unlike here, you come in the masjid, you have shoe racks. And when you go out, you go straight where you left your shoes. In Makkah, there's going to be a million hujaj. And some people, they just come out, they think that is their sandals and they just put it on or they think, oh, maybe someone left the sandals for me. So they put it on and people don't really steal intentionally sometimes. There are people who steal and who pickpocket you, so you must be very careful. So rather have a shoe bag that you can put your shoes inside and with your overnight bag and of course, when you go into the haram to make salah, you can have your shoe bag, everything right in front of you, make your salah, so when you come out, you don't need to look for your shoes, you have it with you in your shoe bag. Shoe bag is very important. Put, carry some toilet rolls with you, some toilet roll with you in your overnight bag, because on the route, you might be getting off at Jeddah, or whatever, and then you have to travel to Medina or Makkah, and you might be in need to go to the toilet, which is along the roads, and there's no toilet rolls provided there. There you have to be on your own. So put some toilet roll in your overnight bag, toothbrush, toothpaste, a nice towel that you can use, a spare underwear, in case your underwear gets soiled, then you have a spare one with you, in your overnight bag and a spare kurta because you know the toilets unfortunately and I need to warn you now the public toilets along the way is not in the best of shape really you get some toilets you are even too scared to go in because the water lays there, you have to be careful that you don't tramp in the water and it don't spill on your clothing. So if any dirt or impurity spill on your clothing, you cannot make salah in that. That's why I have a spare top, a short sleeve top or whatever for the men and a nice um, spare abaya for the lady inside your overnight bag in case you need it. Some, pe some of those toilets are in such a state you go in and you come out. Really, as, 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 as unfortunate and it's sad because that is supposed to be the birthplace of Islam. And Islam puts so much emphasis on cleanliness. Some of those toilets, you, you have to go in because you can't keep in anymore. So I advise the hujaj, right, breathe in. Go inside, hold your breath, do whatever you need to do. Make your istinja, put on your clothes, and come out. <sighs> Look, this is reality. This is reality, and I'm sharing it with you now. I don't want to get there. When I went for my first hajj, no one warned me about this. 
That's why I thought when I come back one day and I start my own Hajj classes, I want to teach people the way I wish to be taught with simplicity, simpleness. Simpleness is used. Everything is simple and with simplicity. And teach people about the reality on the ground there. Yes, Hajj is holy, but everything is not rosy. And I want you never ever to forget that. Hajj is a jihad. So much so that the Prophet said to the women, Oh ladies, the Hajj for the women is your jihad. It's not easy. Prepare yourself, then Allah will make it easy for you, inshallah. The main thing is, always in Makkah, when you get your Mu'assasa card, you always keep it with you safe. It's a Mu'assasa card, it's called the Igama. Igama, the Arabs will ask you Igama. Not Igama, Igama. Because well, some Haji, the, the police approached the Haji and said, Iqama, meaning asking for his Iqama. He stood, salah, qad salah. He started making Iqama. Now that card is not the Iqama, it is called the Igama, it is your Mu'assasa card, which is your identification, which takes the place of your passport, because once you reach there, they take your passport in, and you only see your passport the day when you leave again. So your passport is given to you in the form of a Mu'assasa card, which is called Igama. The main thing that you always need to remember, always conduct yourself with dignity and full decorum, meaning with respect. Allah has called you to be his guest. Every haji who goes for hajj and every mu'tamir who goes for umrah, since the moment you are gone from your home, the moment you step out of your home, you are the guest of Allah. Until you reach back home and you set your foot back into your home, you've been the guest of Allah. That's why. Know what is respect, self-respect. Respecting yourself, respecting your fellow hujaj, respecting the holy grounds on which you are going to walk and respect and revere the entire process of Hajj and the entire process of Umrah. That is why this, what I've given so far, is an introduction to preparation for Hajj. Now, the certain shurut of the Hajj. Shurut means requirements. Hajj is not just, Hajj is a duty that we owe to Allah, yes. But Hajj only become farud on a person if you meet with certain requirements. And the very first requirement is, in order to go for Hajj, you must be a Muslim. You must be Muslim. Hajj is not farud or required from a non-Muslim. Now someone might ask, and I was asked this question before, that's why I answer it before anyone asks again. If we say that Hajj and Umrah is only for a Muslim, doesn't that sound like discrimination? Aren't we discriminating against people? We say no. Everything has laws. I can't pack my bag and just go walk through the borders of America or Britain or any country. No, I must apply for a visa, isn't it? You must apply for a visa. And only once you get your visa, you are allowed to enter that country. Now likewise, your visa for Hajj and Umrah is your Iman. You must be Muslim in order to perform Hajj and Umrah. Number two, the person must be Balikh. Balikh, sometimes in Cape Town we use the word Mukallaf. But it's actually Balikh, which means the person reach the age of puberty. And when does a girl become Balikh? A girl becomes Balikh when she gets her first 
hide a first menstruation which could even happen to her at the age of nine. Then she is balikh, meaning she's now responsible for her actions. A boy can become balikh any time from the age of 12 onwards when he gets his first wet dream, which is called ikhtilam. And you know, wet dream is when you dream of the opposite sex, hopefully, inshallah, because with all this gay and lesbian business. So actually, a wet dream is you dream of the opposite sex, and in your sleep, you have certain feelings that come up in you, and you have a wet dream, meaning you have an orgasm in your sleep, and you wet your sleep. You wet yourself. Now it doesn't mean you're sleeping and you're dreaming and someone throw water on you and they spite you with water and you say you have a wet dream. No, that a wet dream is that when you have an orgasm within your sleep and you find out when you wake up that you have soiled yourself, then for a boy it can happen at the age of 12 onwards. And if the boy don't get a wet dream, then by the age of 15 he is considered balikh reaching the age of puberty. So Hajj only become fard upon you, first and foremost, if you're Muslim, and if you are Balikh, you have reached the age of puberty, and the person must be of sound mind. You must be Akil. You know what is Akil? Akil means the capacity of thinking, the capacity of the power of, of knowing the difference between right and wrong. Akil, from where we get the word akil. You remember if a person wasn't right before, they used to say, is akil a sabakil? You remember? So, meaning there's something wrong. So, being akil means you are 100% by your senses and you know the difference between right and wrong. Number four, the person must be free from the bondage of slavery. Now we can say, yes, but we don't have the institution of slavery today. But one cannot predict what might happen in the future. People again are being enslaved in various ways. Or how the world might change. Or a person is maybe incarcerated for a very long time in prison. He hasn't got freedom of movement. So as long as that person don't have freedom of movement, Hajj will not be far upon them unless that person is free. Number five, the person must have the necessary power, ability, and provision for the journey and care for the needs of your dependents whom you leave behind. I have explained that already. Number six, the journey towards the performance of Hajj must be safe. If the road is not safe, then you have the right to postpone your Hajj. You remember some years ago when the war took place, America with its allies attacking Iraq, the desert storm, the desert operation, or Operation Desert Storm. Many people postponed the Hajj. And they had the right to do that because the road is not safe. If the road is not safe, Allah don't want you to put yourself in danger and go and lose your life. You put your hajj back and say, inshallah, when the road is safe next year, then I will go for hajj next year, inshallah. Can you see how flexible Islam is? Islam is not rigid. Islam is not like, you must do this. Islam gives you the option sometimes to do a certain thing or to do it later. And the seventh point is the issue of the mahram. The Nabi alayhi salam is very clear and the hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas that the Prophet said, a man, a strange man must not be alone with a strange woman unless in the company of a mahram. So again, I warn people over and over, we are sitting in a mess today as a community. 
because we have forgotten this. We allow the young man to come into our home and he asks to be my daughter's boyfriend. And I say, yes, okay, they can be boyfriend and girlfriend. And he is now entitled to take her out alone. Believe you me, wherever they park, be it at Lisbeck Park, or at Signal Hill, where else do you park? <laughs> what? Citrus Park. Primrose Park. <laughs> Look, as simple as this. If a young man and a young woman who are strangers to each other, they can get married to each other, if they are alone on their own somewhere, the prophet teaches us that the third person is the shaitan. And believe you me, if a young man is sitting anywhere with my daughter, he's not going to tell her about the khutbah Friday. No, they're not interested in the khutbah. If he does not even try to touch a finger, there's something wrong with him. Because Allah created us with chemicals. Allah created us with such chemicals we have feelings towards the opposite sex. And therefore the prophets say, guard your chastity, guard your integrity, guard your honor. How many people go for Hajj and they are standing there, la baik Allahumma la baik, but their young daughters are out with their boyfriends and not even dressed appropriately according to the teachings of Islam. These are all the things that we must see to before we go for Hajj. There is no boyfriend and girlfriend and courting in Islam. We need to put our foot down. That is why we have so many mass marriages because they are all alone and shaitan is the third person. The Prophet also said in the same hadith, also a woman may not travel alone except with a mahram. Now why is it a mahram and when is a person a mahram? A man can only be a mahram for you, that man that you cannot get married to. Like your father is your mahram, your brother can be your mahram, your uncle paternal or maternal can be your mahram, your grandfather can be your mahram, the husband that you are married to at that moment, he is your protector and your mahram. All those men that you cannot get married to, that man can be your mahram. Your sister's husband, who is your brother-in-law, cannot be your mahram. Because he's your sister's husband and he's a stranger to you. Because if your sister passes away or he divorces your sister, he is entitled to get married to you. So he's a stranger to you. He's not even allowed to touch your hand even while he's married to your sister. He is a stranger to you. So we need to find out exactly. If you want to know, can this particular person be my mahram? Then ask yourself the question, can he marry me? If the question is no, he can't marry me, then he can be your mahram. If the answer is yes, he can get married to me, then he can't be your mahram. Now, alhamdulillah, nowadays some scholars say that the issue of the mahram is seen in a lighter light now because of the method of traveling. In those days, people used to travel in the caravans and along the way, the caravans were attacked, they were attacked by the robbers and people's money were robbed and people's honor, the lady's honor was totally at stake. And for there, that was the reason why there was mahram that the men could protect the honor and the integrity of the lady. Nowadays you find that you can get onto the plane here in Cape Town and eight or nine hours later you get off either in Jeddah or you get off in Medina. So traveling is much more safe. That's why the Saudis even have now changed a law so to say that if a woman is 45 or over, she can come 
without a male mahram. Even Imam Shafi rahmatullahi many moons, many years ago, used to give his verdict by saying that if a woman is by the means to go for hajj, but she don't have a male mahram, then it's allowed for her to go for hajj, but in the company of trusted women. Other ladies who are trusted and loyal and, and trustworthy, they can form a group and they can be protection for each other's honor and each other's integrity at all times. And I've always over the years in my Hajj classes advised women, if you, even if you're in Medina and Makkah and you want to go to certain shops and they never ever go into a shop alone. Make sure that you are always in good company who can serve as your protection. Because fitna can start very quick. And we know our people, our ladies, our people generally in Cape Town, we are very friendly. And we don't mean anything by it. We, don't, we walk with smiling faces. Unfortunately, some Arabs think that when a lady smiles, then she wants to get married to him. So be very careful, guard your honor, guard yourselves, and always take great care of your reputation, of your honor, and your dignity, which is of utmost importance. So those seven points that I mentioned, those are the shurut for hajj. If these shurut or requirements are met, and you are by the means, then hajj become farad upon you. Now, once Hajj become fard upon you, you need to understand in order for you to do a Hajj that is makbul and mabarur and accepted, you need to understand the arkan of the Hajj. The arkan of the Hajj means the pillars of the Hajj. If those pillars, those arkan are left out, then your hajj is incomplete. And there's six, according to the Imam Shafi Madhab, there's six arkan of the hajj. First and foremost, number one, I will just mention the six, and then the first one I will do a little in detail for today's lesson. Okay? Are you with me? The first arkan of hajj is to enter into the state of ihram with a specific niyyah. Like for instance, if you want to go for umrah or you want to go for hajj, especially for hajj, the first arkan of hajj is to go into that state of ihram with the niyyah for hajj. And I will explain that just now. Second arkan or rukun of the hajj is to be present on the plains of Arafah on the ninth day of Dhul Hijjah at the prescribed time, which we will discuss next week, inshallah. Then the third one is Tawaful Ifada, which is the far tawaf of the Hajj. It is called Tawaful Ifada or Tawaful Hajj. Some people refer to it as Tawaf Shukr. But it's Tawaf of the Hajj with the specific niya to make that Tawaf of your Hajj. The fourth rukun of hajj is the walking and the running or the brisk walk between the two hills of Safa and Marwa, which we will explain in the third lesson. Then after that, the fifth rukun of hajj is the shaving or the clipping of the hair, which we will also do in the last lesson. And the last one is the tartib, which means the sequence. There's a sequence how you have to perform your hajj. You can't go to Arafah today and tomorrow you're going to Ihram and then you want to go to Mina. No, there's a structure. There's a tartib. There's a sequence which you must follow as a hajji in order for your hajj to be accepted. Now let me briefly explain the first one. The first rukun of the hajj 
is the state of ihram with the niyyah for hajj. Now when you have gone to Medina, you've gone to Makkah to perform your Umrah, now you stay in Makkah, now the days of hajj come on. And the first day of hajj is on the eighth day of the month the first day of Hajj, of the five days of Hajj, is on the eighth day of the Hijjah. You know the month of the Hijjah? Get the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, the eighth day. The eighth day of the Hijjah is the first day of the actual five days of Hajj. That is the morning that you now go into Ihram. And I'm going to explain to you very simply how to go into Ihram. Now you don't have to go to the Miqat, the boundaries. You can go into Ihram right where you are in your hotel. Whether you're in Azizia or whether you full stay in Makkah, you now go into your Ihram. And what is advisable for you is that either the night before or an hour before Fajr, work out your logistics. It depends how many people are using one bathroom also. You know, you have to take all those things into consideration because it is sunnah to make a ghusl. Take a sunnah ghusl. And very simple, when you want to make a sunnah ghusl or a fard ghusl, both are uh, the same. Sometimes we take a sunnah ghusl, sometimes we are in need of a farald ghusl. How do you do a ghusl? First and foremost, of course, if there's a need for you to go to the bathroom, to the toilet, you go to the toilet and you make sure that you make proper istinja and so forth. And now you go stand in your shower cubicle and you wash your entire body from head to tow with soap and water. Wash your entire body. Take your time, wash every part of your body from the top of your head, including your hair, your whole body till your feet. Then you stand under the tap and let the water flow on your body. You're flowing, you're rinsing off all the soapiness from your body. Once all the soapiness from your body has been removed, now it is sunnah to take a complete wudu. It's not fuddled, it's sunnah and advisable. You take a complete wudu while you are still there in the shower. After taking wudu, you stand under the tap where the water comes out with the niya, nawaitu sunnah tal ghusl lil ihram. You don't have to say it out loud, you can even think it or you can express it, if you want to, in your own language. You don't have to stand there with a the kitab or someone shout the niya for you. No, you can just have in your mind and in your heart, Oh Allah, I make niya to make a sunnah ghusl for ihram, for hajj. Simple as that. And no one can tell me that they don't know how to say that niya. Whether you speak Afrikaans or whether you speak English, any niya and any dua you can make in your language. In fact, you can perform your whole hajj or your whole umrah without a single verse, without a single word of Arabic. You can speak to Allah in Afrikaans or in English and your hajj or your umrah is as right as the person who speaks Arabic. So simple, Islam is very simple. The Nabi say, inna dina yusr, that the deen is easy. And it only becomes difficult for those who make it difficult upon themselves. So now you've washed your whole body with soap and water. You've rinsed off all the soapiness. You take a complete wudu or abdas. And then you stand under the tap and let the water flow with the niya of ghusl on your head and make sure the water flows down your body front and back. And then you turn and let the water fall on your right hand side, front and back, 
and make sure also under your armpits because the water must touch every single part of your body. Then you turn to your, light, your left and let the water fall onto your left shoulder, front and back, also underneath here. Make sure the water has flown over your whole body and there your ghusl is complete. Simple as that. So no one can say they don't know how to make ghusl. You wash your complete body, I'm repeating, for the sake and the benefit of everyone. You wash your whole body with soap and water. You rinse off all the soapiness. Sunnah to take a complete wudu and let the water then flow from on top of your head, front and back, on your right side, front and back under your armpits, on your left side, front and back under your armpits, and there you have your complete ghusl. Now listen to me. You've done your whole ghusl for, for Umrah, of, I mean you've done your whole ghusl for Hajj, but you are not in Ihram yet. And I want you to follow this now. You've done your ghusl, but you're not in ihram yet. Now you've done your ghusl, you can even put a little bit of atr or sweet smelling oil or whatever because you're not in ihram yet. Now the men will put on two seamless pieces of clothing, one which we call the lungi, which covers the lower part of the body, from above the, knee, above the navel till under the knee. That is the lungi part, and there's a way that you put that on. We always demonstrate for people how to. So before you go into ihram, the group that you travel with, they always have spiritual leaders with them. Ask them the night before you go into ihram to give you the demonstration of how to put on your ihram that you don't fall off. Because men, you will not have anything on. You strip yourself naked in the presence of Allah and the only thing you have on is a two pieces of seamless cloth. There's deep spiritual significance in that. The ladies' ihram is exactly how you are dressed. You can have your abaya on, you can wear socks, you have to cover your hair. The only thing is, the moment the lady goes into ihram, you are not allowed to wear a cloth covering and touching your face. Otherwise you must pay a dam. Because the woman's aura is, the whole woman is an aura, but the Nabi explained, except for your face and your two hands. So your two hands and your face remain open. For those ladies maybe who are so used to wearing a niqab to cover their face, if they want to wear a niqab, then they must wear it in such a way that the cloth does not touch the skin of your face. That's why you will get there and you will see ladies who got this veil over but they wear a cap and it hangs there. It's not supposed to cover but you don't have to cover your face because your face is not part of your aura. Right? So woman, you are as you are, you remain in your beautiful clothing. Men will have the two seamless clothing and of course the second part of the men is the rida, the other part which covers your, both your shoulders. So you have your lungi on and you have the other part, the rida, over your two shoulders. Now you've put on your ihram clothing but you're not in ihram yet. Are you following me? You've done your ghusl, you're not in ihram yet. Right? You put on your ihram clothing, you are not in ihram yet. Now you must make two raka'ats, salatul ihram. Salatul ihram consists of two raka'ats, 
In the first raka'ah, you will read Surah Fatiha and Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. In the second raka'ah, you will read Surah Fatiha and Qul Wallah Wahad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So what have you done thus far? You've done your ghusl. You've put on your ihram clothing. You made your two raka'at salatul ihram. You are not in ihram yet. Are you following me? Right. What I always tell people, once you make your salatul ihram finish, you come down to the foyer where we all stand together, then I usually say the niyyah in front for the hujaj, and they repeat after me, and the niyyah is, Allahumma inni uridul hajj wa ahramtu bihi lillahi ta'ala. Meaning, O oh Allah, I intend to perform hajj. I now enter into the state of ihram for hajj. Make it easy for me and accept from me. The moment you say that niya, now you are in the state of ihram. Now you're in the state of ihram. And the first words you say when you're in the state of ihram, labbaik Allahumma labbaik. لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيْكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَالنِّعْمَةَ لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ لَا شَرِيْكَ لَكَ You say, Here I am, O Allah. This must be understood on a very high spiritual level. And I always ask myself and my hujaj, I say, can you imagine, you say, Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, Here I am, O Allah. And suddenly a voice asks you, Who are you? Can you imagine that? So when I say, Here I am, O Allah, Who am I presenting to Allah? It's important that you understand where you come from. We all know about Qiyamah. That the world is going to end and there's going to be a day of Qiyamah when we all stand in front of Allah. But do you know there was already a Qiyamah? There was a first Qiyamah that all of us stood in the presence of Allah. And Allah make mention of this in the Quran. Every person that has gone already, every person that must still be born Till the day of judgment, we all stood in Allah's presence and Allah asked us, Alas to be Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Am I not your God, your creator, your nourisher, your sustainer, your maintainer unto perfection? Qalu bala. Each and every one of us, even the greatest disbeliever today, each and every one of us, at that time we said, Bala. Most certainly Allah, you are our Lord, shahidina, and we bring shahada and belief in you. All of us said that. And there from Allah's presence, Allah send us down one by one, one by one Allah send us down into the backbone of your father. And then Allah brought your mother and father together in the union of love and as a sperm you flowed from the backbone of your father into the blessed womb of your mother. And there as a leech-like creature on the wall of the uterus inside the womb of your mother, Allah grant you sustenance and Allah caused you to grow. Allah say, I first gave you the power of hearing inside your mother's womb. So the baby inside the mother's womb can hear. Then Allah say, then I give you sight. The baby can see everything inside the womb of the mother. So the baby can hear and see while that baby is still unborn. That's why we always say, mummies, when you are pregnant, read as much Quran as you can audibly. Make as much tasbih and dhikr of Allah audibly. Sit in good company where good things are taking place. Everything the baby picks up. The baby picks up. The baby hears. And that's why you find babies who, who are so used to, the, to, to listening to good stuff that babies are born 
so pure and so relaxed and so rested as if spirituality has already embraced a child. Some babies are so restless, they keep crying, they keep crying, and every time they run to the imam to mantra out the baby. Why? Why, do you think? Because that mummy was in the wrong environments. That baby is so used to listening to who let the dogs out, doof, doof. The baby is still not at ease. And who's to be blamed? You as the mother and the father who don't see that the child gets spiritual nourishment even while the child is in the womb of the mother. So Allah calls us to flow as a sperm from the backbone of our father into the womb of our mother. And when the mother was four months pregnant, Allah ordered the malaika to blow the ruh in that baby. Who's all mummies here? I'm just asking the side, eh? <laughs> we will never be pregnant, alhamdulillah. Who's all mummies? Mummies, I'm asking you. Can you remember that first kick that tiny baby gave inside you? How wonderful it was. How joyful you was. How happy you became calling your husband. Baby's kicking. And he came and he feel. And when he feel, baby don't kick. <laughs> you remember? Can you imagine Allah's workings taking place inside your body? How holy you are. How precious you are as a woman. How wonderful Allah has structured you. Don't you think that's why maybe the reason why Allah has placed the Jannah under your feet as the woman and not under the feet of the Imam or any other man? The Jannah is under the feet of every woman because Allah has made you special. Allah has chosen you to continue the process of creation. And so Allah gave us life. And then Allah caused our mothers to give birth to us. Pain after pain coming into this world. And when you came into this world, your nourishment was waiting for you into the blessed breast of the mother in the form of your milk. I didn't work for it. But my sustenance, my milk was waiting for me. Allah placed it there. So when we say, La baik Allahumma la baik, then you are saying to Allah, Here I am, O Allah, that one who stood in your presence, who was in the backbone of my father, who flowed as a sperm into the womb of my mother, who went through all that stages of an embryo, a fetus. Oh Allah, you made me flesh inside the womb of my mother. Then you made me bones, and then you covered my bones, Allah, with meat, and you covered my meat with skin and flesh, oh Allah, and then you gave me life, Allah. Then you gave my mother to give birth to me, and today, after all those stages of growth, and development, yeah, I am, O oh Allah. Yeah, I am. Therefore, now already, get rid of any form of arrogance, any pride, any jealousy, any hasad, any anger for one another. Give maaf and ask maaf from each other. In that way, when you say, La baik Allahumma la baik, Ya I am Allah, you present to Allah a person who is cleansed and who are pure to the best of your ability. This is ihram. That is why the great Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah alayhi, he likened the travel of Hajj and Umrah to your travel into the year after. And he said, oh, Hujaj, take note. When you put on your clothing of ihram, you are like a person who's putting on your kafan, your clothes that you are going to be buried with. We are only going to be buried in white sheets, nothing else. My grand juba, my kofiya, 
I turban, I scarves, everything remains behind. I leave this world naked, wrapped in a few pieces of sheet as I came into this world naked. And you go into ihram naked. So your clothing of ihram is like your clothing of your kafan. When you get into your bus or your taxi and they take you towards Masjid al-Haram where you're going to make your tawaf, you are like a person who is carried in your cartel. You know the cartel that they carry the dead people in? So as you move, you are like a person who's got your kafan on and you are now being carried to your grave. When you come to the Kaaba and you see the Kaaba for the first time, you are like a person who sits up in your grave. Because the Nabi say the most critical point in your existence is your first night in the Qabr. That is why when people pass away, make as much as Quran and do ask for them and give sadaq on their behalf because they need that to ask. The most critical point is now you are alone in your cupboard and you sit up. When people walk 40 steps away from your cupboard, you sit up and your hearing becomes so enhanced that you can hear the footsteps of people walking away. They are going home now, leaving you all alone. You sit up realizing I've been buried and suddenly Munkar and Nakir, the two angels, appear in your grave to question you. So when you see the Kaaba for the first time, you are like a person who sit up in your Qabr as people walk away. And the day of Arafah, when you stand on the plains of Arafah, you are like a person who stand in front of Allah on the day of Qiyamah. So can you see what profound and deep meaning this journey of Hajj means for us. It's not a joke. It's not a vacation. It's not a holiday. It's not a time that I just go because I need to get away from everything, so I'm going quickly to Makkah and Medina. Yes, you can go to Makkah, but have you truly performed Hajj? Going to Makkah is one thing. Performing Hajj is another thing and that is the real thing and that's why we need to make Hajj and undertake this journey of Hajj in the simplest way that we can the simplest way that we can but with understanding and if you basically understand what I've explained thus far then inshallah you and I we are ready for Hajj inshallah May Allah call us all, Amin. And may Allah remove the obstacles from people who yearn to go on this journey. And as difficult this year is for us and for the Hujaj who are leaving, we ask Allah to open the doors of ease. Allah keep His hand, divine hand of protection over all the Hujaj and over all of us. And may Allah grant all of us to undertake this journey, Amin. And now, I'm going to ask you, before I end up, a very important question. Vi, wil amal saam gaat? One, two, three, four, five, six. Amin, amin, amin. La baik Allahumma la baik. Yeah, I am ready to go for this journey, Allah. Please call all of us. Amin, ya Rabbil Alamin. We've got a few minutes left. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am? Yes. Very good question. The question is, now with COVID protocols being implemented, in Makkah, if they require you to wear your mask, it is permissible for you to wear your mask. It is permissible. 
Okay? Because it's for a reason, and that is for your own protection. I know a lot of people has got very much different views. Some call the COVID, uh, COVID protocols, they call it Satan's protocols. Allah alam. I don't get involved in this senseless debates. Whether COVID is real, whether it is from Allah, or whether it is man-made, it is real. And I can attest to that because I was in a hospital for a week knowing what COVID is, having turned around from death's door because I spoke to my Allah. When that moment when I thought, the thought came to my mind, I might never leave this hospital the way I'm feeling, I immediately, I cried to my Allah and I said, Oh Allah, if it is my time to go, then I must confess that I'm not ready to come. Please, Allah, give me another chance. And Allah, with the du'as of my mother, who stood outside at the hospital, who couldn't come in, she stood outside crying to Allah. And the du'as of all my peoples in my classes and the jamaats, Allah has accepted that du'a. And I said to Allah, give me another chance. And Allah gave me another chance. Here I am. Thinking I'm not going to make it, yeah, I am. Allah has given me. So I know COVID is real. But I'm not going to argue and debate with anyone. All I can ask you is, don't defy the authorities and say, I don't believe in that and you can't force me to wear a mask. They will put you in prison. They don't play there. So for your own safety and for things to go smooth and to flow smooth, abide by the protocols and abide by the laws that are implemented, inshallah. Shukran for that question, Anji. Are there any last questions before we close down? Okay, one moment, the man, man was created first. <laughs> okay, the Ajit's hand was up first, yes? Salatul Haram, does it have to be performed individually, or you and your wife can do it together? Beautiful. Salatul Ihram, must it be performed individually? Yes, it is performed individually, but if you and your wife are together in your room preparing to go together and making the Salatul Ihram together, you lead the Salah for Bismillah Tafaddal. It is between you and Allah. Taib? Inshallah. Last question from the lady who asked a question. Um, the age that I mentioned according to Saudi law, uh, a lady who is 45 or over, she can go without a male mahram and it's still standing. Yes. Um, look, they put in place certain uh, um, laws now and principles that they won't allow people to come for Hajj with 65 or over. That is not a rule that they can put forever. It is just there now for COVID protocols because elderly people are also more vulnerable. And elderly people need assistance from the younger family members. So inshallah, let's hope that by next year or the following year, all those protocols will fall away and things will get back to normality, inshallah. And Allah call all those, whether they are 65 or 75 or 85, and they can go and they have the help to go. May Allah call all of us. But just remember, and I'm ending off with this now, Hajj does not belong to anyone. Hajj does not belong to the Saudi government or to the Muassasa or to anyone or any organization. Hajj is Allah's divine calling. Allah is the one who calls. Make your niyyah and ask Allah to call you. And may Allah call all of us. Ameen. Ya Rabbal Alameen. I will see you all next Saturday, inshallah, starting at half past one with our... Uh, second lesson inshallah and this lesson today is also recorded so if you want to look at it again you can go to youtube
or it's also on Facebook. And uh, if you go to YouTube, you just type in Masjid Al-Quds and they will give you the lesson and you can have a real look at it, inshallah, on YouTube. And you can also see how beautiful you look, inshallah. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal asr, innal insana lafi khusr, illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat, wa tawasaw bil haq, wa tawasaw bil sabr, sadaqallahu maulana al-azim, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. No one will care for you like your parents will care for you. At Annur Education Center, we give orphans a loving home, clothing, food, and education. Be the orphan's parent by sponsoring an orphan for 18,000 Rand or 1,500 Rand per month. Annur Education Center, a place where orphans call home. Imagine, imagine a world where each person has access to their basic rights. A world where everyone is equal. Imagine a world where each person will have an equal share in each single seed of wheat. Where each child has the freedom to learn. This Ramadan, we ask you to feed the fasting in 14 countries around the world with AMA. Provide an iftar box for 100 rand, a hamper for 1,500 rand, or feed a village for 15,000 rand. Donate today at Africa Muslims Agency and imagine the difference you can make.